point. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to tell some more stories that kind of, um, that I like to tell about the film um, and that we didn't have time for this morning. Um, and it's just, every time I watch it, I kind of think, oh God, I've got to tell people about that. I think I told you yesterday, people who came to the film, that the photograph that was shown to the, to the jury that we had, the actors we had playing the jury, we showed them the actual photograph of baby boy A. And there was only one take that was taken of that, that had, it had such an impact on, on the people who were there. Um, another story that's interesting is um, the baby that we have in the film. So we've got, you know, there's a nice baby, the, AD, the ADA's baby, that's a, a baby, right? Trafford. And I don't know if a lot of you know what happened with the film American Sniper. So, uh, so, so American Sniper, there's a baby in American Sniper. And, you know, when you have a baby in a film because, you know, never work with animals or children, whatever, you know, it, you, you have to have a backup plan because, you know, if a baby gets sick or whatever. So, like, like American Sniper had a baby and a backup baby, and both of their babies failed, basically. Both of them, you know, weren't were unwell or whatever. And so, and I don't know if you noticed it, but, I mean, I was in the movie theater watching American Sniper, and people boo. Like, people booed. And uh, you know how beautiful that film is, how perfect that film is. They had a doll. So I was obsessed with that, right? And you can tell. I mean, it's so bad. There's a scene, and she's there like this, and the doll, and you're thinking, oh my, you know, can you see the head? And it's like awful, right? And uh, so we had this whole thing, you know, we're going to have a real baby. We're going to have a real, you know, because I thought it was really important that we had a real baby because, um, well, given the fact that this film was about a lot of dead babies, it would be really important for people to get to see a real baby, a beautiful baby. So um, so when, I, when we, we went down, the director... And, you know, people who were involved with finding the locations and all that, we went down to Oklahoma and I went to, to find babies and, uh, very, you know, people were very kind. There was a woman down there who helped me find a bunch of babies. So then a whole bunch of babies came um, for interview, you know. <laughs> so these lovely, lovely girls came, Oklahoma, girls from Oklahoma with their lovely babies. And uh, I interviewed a whole lot of them and like, they were all adorable. And, but there was a woman with twins and she had twin boys and I was thinking, hmm, nice, because you could swap them out. And uh, so it's a very nice idea. So I was all set with this woman and her twins, you know. And the night before, like the night before we needed the babies, um, her husband phoned me. And he's like, hello, you know, um, I'm the father of these twins and I, have, I found out what this is about. I don't want my children having anything to do with this. I don't want anything to do with you and all this kind of thing. And I just thought, I didn't even, I didn't even attempt to argue with him. I just thought, that's fine. I said, that's absolutely fine. I hear you, sir, and that's absolutely fine. No, don't do that. But so I, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, God, this is a nightmare, right? Um, but there was another baby that I kind of had this thing in my head. I just had a, this baby. It really had an impact on me. And the baby's name, by the way, is Trafford. Anybody know what Trafford, what Trafford is? It's kind of an interesting one. Anyone follow um, British soccer? Okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a football, there's a, yeah, Old Trafford. There's a football grounds of, is a Man United? I think it's Man United. Man United's football grounds are called Old Trafford. And the husband of this, ba the, 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 the father of this baby is a big f soccer fan. The baby's called Trafford, right? So I, I had my Trafford in my head or whatever, whatever. So I phone up the mother the night before, like late. And she's adorable. And uh, she said, yeah, this is the kind of stuff that happened all the time, by the way. Just, you know, she said, um, oh, we've been praying about this. And we would love Trafford to be in the film. We'd love Trafford to be in the film, you know. And so Trafford came, right? And, you know, and as I said, you know, you never want babies because it's a complete disaster or whatever. Oh, you want Trafford, though. <laughs> so, you know, when you're doing these scenes, it's like, put the baby down, put the baby up. Would you lift the baby, put the baby up, and then put the baby down, and put the baby up, and then put the baby back down. No, put him down and put him... No, you put him up now and put him down and put him over there and put him back. No, put him down now. Put, yeah, bring him up again and bring him over there. Here's Trafford. Right? Oh my God, right? Like, unbelievable. Not a peep out of him. And uh, I just said to her, I said, this, uh, of course, everyone on the set, and a lot of these were very professional people, the director, the actors, you know, they do this all the time. And they're kind of going, oh, look at this. And, you know, put him up, put him down, put him down, you put him up, and you put him down, and all this, right? And, right? So I said to the mother, oh my God, this is such a great baby. And she said, we, we, you know, that they'd prayed over him the night before. This is the type of people we're dealing with here, you know. So, uh, so anyway, but then anyway, the next thing is that, you know, there's a scene in the film, those guys, that you guys have saw it, you know, that th there's a scene where he's sick, where the baby is sick. And uh, the director sort of said, uh, you know, does the baby ever cry? Could you ask the mother, does the baby ever cry? Like, you know, whatever. <laughs> and I said, I, so I went to her, and you can't, I cannot tell you, you'd eat her with a spoon. Like, she's just perfect, right? She's the most lovely girl. And uh, I said, Caitlin, Caitlin Grassmeyer. And I said, uh, Caitlin, does he ever, does he ever cry, you know? And she said, I can totally pinch him. I can, I can totally pinch him. And I, and I said to her, I said to her, yeah, Caitlin, 
do you know what the film is about? Yeah. No one's pinching babies in this film. I said, I don't care, you know, whatever. I said, we know pinching. And I said, can, you, can we come up with anything else? You know, and she said, you know, he just loves being held. She said, he just loves being held. You know, if you put him down, you know, he just loves being held. So, you know, you know. so what they did was uh, the actress, you know, and the actress is walking around at him, walking, walking here, walking there. The mother is not in sight. He's, like, he's all relaxed. And then, and then just before they started to roll, they said, OK, put him down. And they put him down. And he was like... And this absolutely, and you, you, you know, the quality of the picture wouldn't have been perfect yesterday, but when it's on the big screen, you'll see this absolutely perfect here. And we're like going, what is, what is it, this kid? And like, honestly, all the kind of very professional people were saying, this kid could make a fortune, Trafford, because he's like the best kid, he's like the best kid ever to work with. Um, and other stories, another story, but you can't tell anyone this. Has this been filmed, by the way? Um. Good, no. Don't, don't film this, because I want to tell a story, but you can't tell anyone. Oh. Yeah. One of the people in the audience, you know, there's a big audience there, and it was one person who stood out, um, Julie, um, I won't say her surname, but anyway, Julie, and I've mentioned her in the book, but she um, worked at Hearn's late-term abortion clinic in Boulder, Colorado, and she's had a conversion. She's, you know, she's, uh, you know, offering her life up to Jesus, trying to uh, make amends for what happened, um, and she's in the film. <laughs> She's actually in the film. She's in the the gallery, and you know, I don't know if you, I'm not sure if you might have spotted her, but she's there. But so is Christine Wexler, the assistant district attorney. Christine Wexler is in the film, um, and when you see the scene at the grand jury, she's the first face you see. She's this like really nice looking blonde, and she came on the set, and so did Jim Wood. And Jim Wood's in the film. Um, there's a scene with Jim Wood, and he got into the whole cop outfit and all this kind of stuff, and he really enjoyed that. Um, and he is an extraordinary. Um, guy and just a wonderful, a wonderful person to know. Um, let me just make sure that this doesn't happen to me again. Um, how much time have I got? Uh, it's now a quarter to, quarter to what? Eleven. How much time are we I've got ten minutes. I've got, we're, we're fine, we're fine, that's great. So, um, yeah, we're so yeah, you gotta be careful here. And um, there's another guy in the, in the film, a tall man. Like we had all these extras, and lots of extras came and said they wouldn't be paid, which was really, really helpful. Um, including one guy who, this, you know, and I, I used to see, th I mean, there was a lot of extras, like a, over 100, and they'd be hanging around, you know, and I used to go down and chat to them and everything. Um, and like, it's a, hard, it's a tough job, because it's a long, long day, and they're eating kind of sandwiches and stuff. And uh, there was a guy there that, that was there all the time, a very tall man, white haired, with a, a, a mustache, white mustache. Um, and at the end, he basically came up and, and introduced himself and said, I'm really glad. And I, you know, I, he had traveled a distance to be in the film and to be an extra and to help out. And when he was a younger man, so he was a man in his like 60s, he said when he was, when he was a younger man, his girlfriend aborted his, his, their twins um, without, without telling him. And he became a pastor as a result of it. So his whole life had been altered and uh, just, so there was that, you know, stuff like that happened con and ha continues to happen and we meet amazing people, including, and I just want to say something about the Trump election because I just really liked what, really liked what Marjorie said about that. Um, and I uh, just amazing, you know, the, uh, yeah, of course, of course Trump won the election. Like, <laughs> um, of course uh, Trump won the election. And I love this, I just love this story. And of course I find Trump myself, I like, Oh, don't, right? I, you know, a little bit cringeworthy, right? He does the odd thing and you think, this is just so bad. And he's got that kind of, and he's great. That's a great guy. And you're thinking, oh, you know, like a kind of a game show host, whatever. You know, and he has that kind of rather unfortunate thing, right? But you know what? Who cares? We had suave. We had suave. We had slick, you know, and we didn't much like it. Um, but here's my story that I adore about this. So we did a crowdfunding campaign, and I swear I could write a book about the crowdfunding campaign. You can't believe, there's a woman in Australia who sends, she sends a check for $50 every month. You know, this is what people did, and you need to do it if you didn't do it already. You need to send something at least, because the 29,000 people should be 229,000. So anyway, the day after, so with crowdfunding, you say, um, we want this much money. If you don't get the money, all the money goes back. So we asked for $2.1 million. If we had raised $2 million, we'd have lost everything. It would have all gone back. We would have, we would have got nothing. You had to make it, or you know what I mean, right? So it's fixed funding. So you can imagine, every day was a nightmare. Every day was a complete nightmare in the fr crowdfunding, because it was like every day, and I can't remember what it was, and m people, uh, I should have the treasurer here to help me with that. But um, you know, with some, obviously it was like multiple tens of thousands of dollars a day that we had to get, or you start slipping behind, right? And, oh, it was just a complete nightmare. But anyway, and the day after we succeeded, 
and we're like, phew. Uh, Magda phones, Magda's another partner in the company. She phones and she says, did you see, did you see what just happened? Look, look at the thing. And I looked and some one person had sent $25,000. And I'm thinking, wow. And you know, I'm always doing this stuff in my head. And by the way, w one person sent $50,000, a woman, by the way. Yeah, I've met her. Um, <laughs> funny that, yeah. Um, and another woman sent $10,000. I, I mean, you know, amazing. But this one, anyway, this one, after we got the money, sent $25,000, right? And I'm like looking him up and finding out he's a baker and he's in Massachusetts, right? And what he got for that was that we'd go to Boston and we'd show the film and all that kind of thing, right? So, and I'm thinking in my head, if you have $25,000 to give to something, you gotta be loaded, right? You gotta be super wealthy, right? So I'm gonna think, and so then the guy gets in touch and he says, um, oh, by the way, I don't want you to pay for your flights. You know, I want all the money to be in the film. So, you know, so I'm gonna buy the flights. You tell me when you wanna leave and all that, and I'm gonna buy the flights. And by the way, when you come here to Boston, you know, I don't want you to stay in a hotel. I want you to stay with me. And I'm thinking, this will tell you now how shallow I am, right? I'm thinking, the house is going to be gorgeous. $25,000, he obviously lives in a lovely house. I'm saying to Phelan, this will be fabulous. We're going to stay in a fabulous house, right? So we arrive in Boston, and this guy meets us at the thing, at this, at the, at the, uh, himself meets us at the airport, wearing a suit I would say he bought 15 years ago, maybe longer. Then we get in his car, which is for sure 20 years old, and then we drive to his house, which is the most ordinary house in an ordinary town of ordinary houses, and his is like the most ordinary. And we go into the kitchen, and he said, do you mind if we just... Um, I'd like to pray now, right? And, you know, and the gift and Anne and Phelan and it's great and all that, you know, but really what I want to pray about, you know? What I really want to pray about is to thank God that Donald Trump is the President of the United States. And he's saying this in a really quiet voice and a really, you know, really lovely guy, real quiet spoken, real shy, very, and we call him, I was saying that to somebody last night, I don't know if it's the same here, he's a Presbyterian. You know, does it that means a certain thing in, in Ireland. Now, I don't know what it means here, but in Ireland what it means is sober, you know, s sober, hardworking, you know, um, you know, not colourful, if you know what I mean. I don't mean that the way it's, you know what I mean? Very sober is be the best way, you know, correct person. And he was basically a Presbyterian. This guy, that's, he is a Presbyterian and he is kind of that kind of person. Very, very, a serious guy, a lovely man, a modest, modest, that's another word to add to the thing. And I'm thinking he, with such clarity, voted for Donald Trump. And I thought, that's why Donald Trump was elected. Because a guy like that, this gorgeous man, and when you hear how gorgeous that man is. So of course, the next day, we did the screening, da, 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 that's a whole other story. But in the morning, we have to get to the airport really early. Oh no, I'm going to drive you. You know, had to get up at half three in the morning. Oh yeah, no problem. He got up to bring us to the airport himself, right? And so we get up and uh, we're in the car and I'm saying to him, you know, how did you get involved? How did you get involved in this whole pro-life thing? And he said, I said, was it the church? And he said, my church were no, were no oh, my church weren't very good, right? But all very quiet and thing. And I, I can't tell, you know, any of you who know when I, when I talk about Presbyterian, I hope you get the picture in your head. Just a very shy, kind of shy guy, very shy, not showy. The exact opposite, actually, of Trump. That's what he's like. And uh, he, um, you know, how did you get involved? Oh, yeah, my church weren't any good, you know. But, um, yeah, no, I, 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 go, I go and pray outside the clinics. I've been doing that for, you know, since the beginning. And, uh, yeah, I've been actually, um, I've been arrested 21 times. <laughs> this guy. Isn't that just perfect? And this guy, it'd be the worst thing that could happen to a guy like that. You know, he's such a law-abiding type, you know. I mean, he would never have speeded in his car in his life. You know what I mean? And here he was, and I just thought, this, is the this guy had zero uh, question in his head about who to, who to vote for. That's why Donald Trump was elected. There's lots of men and women like that guy in this country. And they were so clear about it, and they were so right. And no one would have done what Trump has done. I th Rubio wouldn't have done it? No way! You know, and I don't know, you know, I, mean, I'm, I won't even go through the list, but I am serious. I, I think this is very extraordinary. That Donald Trump, I know, awful, desperate, dreadful, perfect. <laughs> perfect. The right man at the right time, and I don't think anyone else could have beaten Hillary Clinton, other than him. And it's just brilliant, just fantastic. And then the other thing on him, on, tr on Trump, that I think is interesting is, um, you know this thing of... 
uh, that he, s he was asked about women who have abortions. Do you remember this? And he said, oh, shock, shock, shock. Do you remember, the, he really, uh, everyone got, uh, that the women should be arrested. Do you remember that? So uh, this is very, they should be punished. Or, yeah, they should, yeah, whatever. There, sh there should be some punishment, right? It's very interesting. So the, the jury in the trial of Kermit Gosnell, who got a big, big education on abortion, and who were all pro-abortion, said the same thing. They said the same thing. They said, why are the women not being tried? The women who had gone to that clinic, nine months pregnant, by the way, in one case. A woman had gone and had an abortion at nine months. Um, you know, so, and I, I thought it was a very good, I thought it was a very good point. And by the way, in the book, we have a story of a man, a Muslim man, by the way, and his wife was pregnant, I think with, I'm nearly sure it was with twins. And th I don't know, they were having marital difficulties, whatever. And she sort of ran off on him and he was kind of working out wh where was she, whatever. And then she kind of came back and there was all this thing. Oh, she had a miscarriage. She had had miscarriage. And then he saw her credit card bill and she had gone to Gosnell, and she had aborted their twins. And sh he went to the cops to report her for homicide, and they never pursued the case. And it's in the book, an amazing story. Um, I'm going to stop for a minute. Does anyone have any questions or any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, those are real tweets. Yeah, the tweets in the film are real tweets, and I got in touch with all those people. And some of them you probably you saw John Nolte, right? You, you guys know John Nolte, fabulous. From here, are your own John Nolte, John Nolte NC on Twitter. You can tweet him as well and say that I gave him a shout. I'd love John, John Nolte. Um, and there's uh, Ida Flo. You know who Ida Flo is? You'll see her. If you're a tweeter, you totally know Ida Flo. And she's like this older lady, and she's a big tweeter. Um, and like her son wrote to me and said he was all thrilled and that she's in the film and all that kind of thing. So yeah, they're actual tweets. Yeah, we used actual tweets. Because I thought, yeah, we should use actual, actual tweets. Because the tweet people, I don't know how many people here in the room were involved in the Twitterverse, the, the, the tweet that storm that went on. Um, Dana Lash was really good. Michelle Malkin was a total superstar. Michelle Malkin helped us from the very beginning. And by the way, Michelle Malkin, I think, gave us, I'm going to say $15,000. She gave us money twice. Michelle Malkin was amazing and continues to be amazing about this film. She was really, really, really good and really strong on this. But she organized these Twitter fests where people all tweeted and tweeted and tweeted and said, why is this not in the media? And eventually, that's how Kirsten Powers found out about the story. And the Kirsten Powers story is very interesting. Do you guys know who, you know Kirsten Powers? She's, so she's the woman who wrote the USA Today op-ed about, um, about Kermit Gosnell. And uh, she's very interesting. Is this being filmed now as well? It's still? No, nothing's been, it's still off? Are we off? And her name is very intentional. So we called her Molly Mullaney, which is two people. So there's J.D. Mullane who's the guy who took the photograph of the empty press benches and who could have gone to prison for that because it's a contemptible uh, thing to have done. It's contempt of court. You're not allowed to take photographs or record inside the courtroom. And he took that photograph, and his name is J.D. Mullane, and you could tweet to him as well, a really great guy. He took that photograph, and that photograph traveled the, the, the globe. The other person that were compos the composite of this is Molly Hemingway. Um, yeah, 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 get religion, Molly Hemingway, who is magnificent and what Molly Hemingway did during the trial was she kept tweeting to all the mainstream media saying where are you where are you why aren't you here what's wrong with you and she particularly wrote to Sarah who writes for the Washington Post and that's Sarah with a surname that I'm not going to pronounce properly that's the Sarah who was obsessed with your woman uh, the one in college who wanted her uh, contraceptive pills. What's her name? Fluke. Fluke. So, Sandra Fluke. Yeah, don't worry. They were all looking nervously there thinking I'm going to say the wrong thing there. No, I was good. I'm my fluke, not anything else, right? So basically, that Sandra Fluke story, Sarah Sh 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 was obsessed with that and wrote about it and wrote about it and wrote about it and wrote about it. And then, so Molly Hemingway wrote to Sarah Sh Sh and said, why aren't you uh, writing about Gosnell? And you remember famously what she wrote back? It's a local story. I don't cover local news. It's a local crime story. It's a local crime story. Gosnell, America's most prolific serial killer, is a local crime story. A guy who had cats walking around in a clinic, 
who ate his cornflakes in the same room where the procedures were going on, who had staff who were untrained, had a 15-year-old anesth anesthesiologist, had a Department of Health in Pennsylvania who hadn't inspected the clinic in 17 years. And that's not a news story. That, that's, that's of not, that there's no national interest in that story. Nonsense. Appalling. And Sarah <laughs> had to apologize. She had to apologize because everyone went nuts about this local crime story thing. And eventually the, the, the Washington Post about three days later then wrote back and said, You're, no, no, it's not a local crime story. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're going to now start covering it. We're going to start covering it. But what they do, what these newspapers do, what the New York Times does, so any time, and we have a, there's a chapter in the book, which you're going to buy because I've got them outside and I'm not going to have to take them back to Los Angeles, right? It's too much weight in my, and when it cost me a lot of money and everything like that. So we're going to work out something. Uh, they have to go. So, um, um, what was I going to say? Yeah, there's a whole chapter in the book about media. And here's what they do. The media, if they like a story, you know, like a story, like Trayvon Martin, they loved Trayvon Martin. You will hear it, they'll have it everywhere. It'll be just, it'll be everywhere. They'll do three stories in the newspaper in the one day on that story, and the following day, and the next day, and the next day, and it's everywhere. So when they say, you know, you'll hear the New York Times saying, we covered the Gosnell trial. They didn't cover the Gosnell trial. Was the Gosnell trial in the New York Times? Yeah, just about. But when they really want you to know a story, my God, you'll never hear the end of it. So what do you call that, off, that, that guy, um, Ferguson, right? The Ferguson um, guy, Michael Brown. Michael Brown. So, so you, here's what I always want to tell people. Michael Brown was a thug. I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry he's dead. I am. I'm very sorry he's dead. But Michael Brown was a thug who, uh, who stole from a corner shop, a mom and pop store, and assaulted the man in that mom and pop store. He then walked in the middle of the road, in the middle of the road, and the policeman came along and said, can you move over? Get over to the curb, right? And then he attacked the police officer while the police officer was sitting in his car. He was pummeling him. And Michael Brown was huge. He was massive. And he would have killed this guy. He would have killed the police officer. And the police officer shot him in defense, and Michael Brown is dead. They want to put a, they want to put a statue to Michael Brown. And the reason they do is because the mainstream media made Michael Brown into something that he wasn't. However, they didn't write about Samika Shaw. Samika Shaw was an African-American woman and is dead f after a botched abortion. So they choose the win, you know, they really like Michael Brown. They really like Michael Brown because they want to say bad things about the police. Um, and, it's, and, and, and here's how effective they are. So the New York Times could never write enough, by the way, and by the way, Fox News couldn't have written enough or talked enough about Michael Brown either.